Hi, and welcome to another edition of Dessert Devotion, where I love sharing two of my favorite things. That's easy dessert recipes and an encouraging word of God. So we're going to start with our dessert first. It's the Charleston Chewy. You're going to love it. It's kind of like a blonde brownie with pecans. So let's get started. So I've melted four tablespoons of butter in a saucepan. I've removed it from the heat for just a bit, let it cool down a little bit. Then I'm adding one cup of brown sugar. So we're gonna give that a stir, make sure that's nice and incorporated. And you don't want this mixture to be too hot because the next thing you're gonna do is add one beaten egg. And we don't want scrambled eggs in our Charleston chewies, right? So I'm going to, going to now stir in the egg. The next step is to add half a teaspoon of vanilla and half a teaspoon of almond extract. Now almond is strong, so don't go crazy. You want exact amounts here. So after we stir all of this together, our next step is to, be, to add our flour and baking powder. Now you want just a teaspoon of baking powder. I've stirred it in with the flour. Now you can sift this if you want, but I actually skipped this, that step this time to see if I liked it. And you know what? <laughs> it was just as good. So that makes the recipe even easier. So you just need three fourths cup flour and a teaspoon of of baking powder. Now it's time to finally add the pecans. Now this recipe is inspired by Cartier Brown's Charleston Chewy recipe. She calls for a fourth cup of chopped pecans. I've added closer to half a cup of pecans because I really like mine to have lots of nuts in it. Now I'm going to pour this into a greased pan. Now you will see this baked a lot in an eight by eight dish. I have a nine inch dish, just a regular pie plate. So mine is going to spread out a little thinner. So I'm just going to watch it a little more carefully and put it in a 350 oven. So I've baked this for about 20 minutes or so, maybe up to 25 minutes. Make sure it's brown on the edges, kind of pulled away and gooey in the center still. And there you have it, Charleston Chewies. Don't forget that added touch of powdered sugar and enjoy, they're even better the next day. So for our devotion today, I'm gonna to be reading from the Gospel of Luke. It's the third chapter, verses seven through 14. John said to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the wrath to come <laughs> that's a great way to start out right <laughs> bear fruits worthy of repentance do not begin to say to yourselves we have abraham as our ancestor for i tell you god is able from these stones to raise up children to abraham even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds asked him, What then should we do? In reply, he said to them, Whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none, and whoever has food must do likewise. Even tax collectors come to be baptized, and they asked him, Teacher, what should we do? He said to them, collect no more than the amount prescribed for you. Soldiers also asked him, and we, what should we do? He said to them, do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusation and be satisfied with your wages. We're jumping right in with John. John the Baptist ministry as a forerunner to Jesus was to encourage the people to understand their need for salvation. 
It was a ministry of repentance. In order to be prepared for the coming of Jesus, to realize that they needed a savior was so important to receiving a savior, right? And so he confronted them with their sin, wanted them to see their sin and to repent, to be baptized and to look for salvation, which was coming in Jesus Christ. Boy, does John paint a picture. He teaches with this image of the ax lying at the tree, getting ready to cut you and I down. The people get it, right? And they say, well, whoa, Jesus is coming. This is a pretty big deal. I am going to be judged. So what can I do about it? And John says, go clean out your closet. You look in your pantry, you have extra food, share it. When you go to work, do what's right. If you're in charge, be fair. That's pretty anticlimactic if you ask me. I mean, I'm sure they were expecting some great thing. Many of them were familiar with the Jewish rituals, right, of the temple. And uh, maybe they were expecting to make some sort of sacrifice or go through some elaborate ritual. Even the pagan religions, right, had often had some kind of a code or mores that they would follow of sacrifice or atonement. But these kind of sound like everyday chores, everyday rituals to share your coat, to share food. This is how we prepare for Jesus. Maybe you've heard the expression, every day is a holiday. (laughs) And we laugh about that because every day is not a holiday. For the past hundred days, while we have been enduring sheltering in place and quarantines, emerging from that, many of us have called that anything but a holiday. Really, for many of us, it felt like one long day of chores that just ran together. Washing clothes, cooking dinner, washing dishes, mowing the lawn, taking out the garbage, cleaning the bathrooms, and repeat. I know I often felt like I didn't know what day of the week it is, let alone have the nerve to call it some kind of holiday. But every day may not be a holiday in the sense of getting away for vacation. But looking at the sort of uh, root word of holiday, every day can be a holy day. It can mean something. We can be present in that day and experience the presence of God in that day. Have you ever laid your head down at night and wondered, what have I done today? Did it mean anything? Where did the time go? I felt like it was just full of menial tasks. I just went to work. I came home. I gave the kids a bath. I cleaned up again. And look, it's time to start all over again. What does it all mean? I think sometimes we have to change our perspective, change the way we measure our day, change the way we experience our days. Instead of giving each day value by these huge, amazing things that we do each day, and if we didn't do something really, really big, then that day doesn't count. What if we understand the value of encountering the holy, encountering God, and the everyday tasks? After all, John says that as we prepare for the coming of Jesus, as we make room for the holy presence of God in our lives, all we have to do is pay attention to the things that we do every day, the things that we are in control of. If you have an extra coat, share it with others. Don't hoard it in your closet. If you have extra food, take the time to prepare a meal for someone who needs it. When you go to work, Be fair about how you treat people. Do the right thing with the things that you are in control of at your job. The tax collectors in the Roman Empire were known for not only collecting for the empire, but padding their own pockets by cheating the people that they were supposed to be collecting taxes from and exploiting them. Don't do that. Do the right thing at work. And if you're in a position of authority, like the soldiers that John gives the example of, right, who were asking, what can we do? They had the authority to uh, 
control, uh, maintain order and control to represent the power of the emperor and even the most far-flung places of the empire. With that authority, with that leadership, with that power to maintain order, John says, use your power, use your authority, use your position in the right way. Don't exploit it to try to get ahead on the backs of others. Many soldiers would use their position to, to make, uh, force people to give them favors. They would exploit those that they were responsible for in their provinces. And the emperor and those in control, the governors, would turn a blind eye to it. They took advantage of their power. But John says, if you were in a position of power, don't do that. Treat people right. Use your everyday authority and leadership for good. Make a positive change where you are. Every day may not feel like a holiday, but every day is a holy day. If we look around, we can encounter the holy presence of God where we are. And the things that we discount and think they don't matter, and maybe because the things are so small, we begin to think that we don't matter. They do. They are our holy tasks. And everyone that we encounter in those everyday tasks, we create a holy place for them and us. Today can be holy and special. And so are you. Amen. Well, thanks for joining me and be sure to join me for another edition of Dessert Devotion.